Yes, KMT, the freedom teacher. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Where do I start? Well, I'm going to start with my mum. I think that's been the most um, significant part of my journey. And it's kind of influenced my beginnings in music to the present day with the garden project, Maple Project Gardens. So I used to be surrounded by music. I was fascinated by music. I love music. And I was always amazed how inclusive it was, despite the hostilities that my family faced. You know, like their experience of racism, you know, economics, poverty, all that, all that drama within that period of time. But yet, music seemed to be like a safe haven, a sanctuary, uh, a place for love, a place for communication. And it was just a fascinating journey for me, just like being involved in music in my household. But within that beautiful scene, I noticed a massive inequality, like, and the inequality existed because my mum and my mum's twin, her sister, were DJs, and when they used to select, or select actually, selectors, they used to play music, DJ, you know, slightly different. Um, they used to select music at the house parties, and they used to kill it. They used to kill it all the time. They used to be like, everyone would be bubbling, everyone would be jamming, everyone would be vibing, but it's like the mans couldn't take it. So the men would sometimes subtly try to nudge them or try to interrupt them or try to... And that was kind of my starting point of understanding music and its role as a social tool. I think that was a starting point. Um, so seeing that, you know, despite it, it, it being a, a tool that could be very inclusive, seeing within that that there was still uh, inequality within that. And ever since then, I've kind of been involved in music, not just for the entertainment part of it, but for the social inclusive, the social cohesiveness of music and the ability to raise awareness about social issues. So I always was listening to music like Fella, we used to listen to The Doors, like the, the music was such a, a broad range of styles and it fascinated me. But hip hop kind of was my home because you know all the music I was listening to was more or less my parents generation from the 70s probably a bit before that but when I first started hip-hop I felt like it was like it was my father talking to me it was my brother talking to me it was my cousin talking to me and then it got even deeper where I was like okay there is a, a mass of American stuff starting to reach me but I wasn't hearing a lot about our stories and I was, again, I've always been looking at readdressing that inequality. So I was like, well, I'm not hearing enough UK. Um, I'd go out and dance at the clubs and I'd like say, you know, have you got any UK? And they'd be like, nah, we don't play UK. And these are the top, these are the top D hip hop DJs. There's still, some of them are still out there now. They remember me from that time being like, not playing UK hip artists and they knew them. They actually knew these people like they were friends and I thought that was a madness. I was like, hold on, you're the gatekeeper on this scene, like you're the pioneer, but you're not repping your people. Mad. So I was like, okay, start DJing. I wasn't DJing because I wanted to be a DJ per se, I was DJing because I felt there was a need to play more UK hip hop. So that was really, that's really been my journey in music. I've always been about promoting the or addressing the inequality or trying to even up or bringing the voice of the voiceless to the fore of any social movement and hip-hop was one of the ways I did that so while all this was going on at the same time that was kind of like me being outside in the public arena people knew me in that that space but in my home people didn't really know um, majority of my life I was a carer and I was a care for my mum. I was care for my mum for 20 years, probably longer than that. And she passed away in two, uh, 19, sorry, 2005. And the hip hop was really a space for me to kind of just get away from the pressures of care for my mum. So that was a way, hip hop was a real a way for escape almost in a sense. But as I started to get more into the scene, I just found that my voice wasn't, 
I was being marginalised in terms of what I was doing. And it, it was very interesting that I started kind of looking for alternative ways to express hip hop. And all the while, I'm living here, I'm coming back and forth from my home and there's this garden. And then my mum's boyfriend used to come and make food and do the gardening and I touched upon it then. But I never really capitalised the space until 2000 and 2008 when my um, head gardener, Randy, moved in, the co-founder, he moved in, he planted his feet in this space. So Randy came and it was like a debris garden, it was just a mess, just grass, weeds everywhere, do you know what I mean? And slowly but surely he just transformed this space. And it was a real magical journey to see how something so negative, like my world was so dark, become something so beautiful and so positive. So as we saw him transforming this space, we were like, okay, let's help him. So we started getting involved in the gardening, started project managing, started getting volunteers, you know, supporting as much as I could, you know. A lot of the skills that I learned on hip hop, networking, da da da, I started bringing to the garden. And it was weird because all this time I was out there doing my thing, and yet I had this beautiful space that didn't even occur to me to actually use it. Someone else had to come to show me the beauty of what I had here. So 2008, um, my mum was called, 2008, my mum was called May, Sonia May. So the reason why this project's called May Project Gardens is that it's a testimony to her life. You know, within the garden you constantly see life and death every day. Do you know what I mean? And it's something that helped me understand and deal with my own personal pain of the situation of caring for my mum and my own growth and development. The garden itself is 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 a actual a demonstration of permaculture. Now permaculture is a system which is becoming quite topical um, at the present moment in the garden and fruit growing community. And it's really interesting to see at the same time in the 70s that this movement was forming, so was hip hop emerging. So it's quite interesting, you've got these black males, you know, developing this, black and Latino males developing hip hop, and you've got predominantly these white males in Australia um, developing permaculture. So the garden basically, if you look around the garden, it's an example of the cycle that I talked about earlier. So with the water butts, for example, you have a situation where I think it's about 1%, 1 to 3% of the earth's um, resources or water is drinking water. Only 1 to 3%. And if you notice in society, we are being we are actually legitimizing commodification of natural resources now once upon a time you go to a water fountain now you pay for your bottled water do you know what i mean and that's what's happening more and more so the water butts is basically just showing that you know what we don't have to we don't have to actually have um that we don't have to purchase um water we can actually capture water from the rain store it use it for the plants all the beds you can see uh, um, are made from mulch which again is a replication of of um, nature you know protective barrier you know you can see that protective layer we use straw and leaves and that means we use less water and it protects it from the sun as well behind me just in the background you can see this beautiful forest garden which is basically a self-sustaining system and imagine if we had forest gardens in the city you know, we've got food bank issues, we've got austerity issues now. All we have to do is just, it's not a difficult pro a proposition. Imagine if we, instead of growing uh, just, just random stuff, imagine if we put forest gardens where there's green spaces, there's a lot of green spaces. What about in the parks, Hyde Park, putting a forest garden in that could feed the city? You know, these are possibilities and it doesn't take much energy as well. So those are all different examples of um, what we have in a garden as well. There's a lot more, but you can go to the website, uh, which is um, mayproject.org, which is M-A-Y-P-R-O-J-E-C-T dot org. And that's mayproject.org. If you go to the website, you can find out a lot more. So 2014, uh, one of the key people, Randy, you know, one of the pioneers, the co-founder of the, the project has gone. 
So I'm now looking how I'm gonna move this this beautiful space forward. Like how am I gonna do it? How is it possible? Like with my skill set, like coming from a hip hop background. And what I've really been doing is actually spending a lot of time in the garden and spending a lot of time in a space and just observing. And what's been really valuable for me is to see how a lot of what I can see in hip hop is replicated in nature. So for example, I have a workshop called the Permaculture Cipher or the Garden Cipher. And it's just about that circle. If you look at nature, you'll constantly see circles everywhere. If you see the back of the snail, the back of the snail has got a circle. Do you know what I mean? If you look at the sun, it's a circle. If you look at the moon, it's a circle. If you look at the herb spiral, it's a circle. And what I've learned from being in the garden is that everything tends to be a cycle. Nothing goes to waste. Whereas in hip hop, it's celebrated for being very wasteful and be very extravagant and being very materialistic. And so I'm just like, imagine if we can just divert that to be more resourceful, be more of a cycle, like how we do in a cipher, a cipher, where we can actually just capture that energy and use it to transform their environments. And for me personally, what it's done for me, it's, it's rooted me. I think hip hop as it is, tends to be very reactionary it's very much you are to blame this is the fault of the government but doesn't take responsibility for what it can do it raises the vibrations the energy so much but doesn't give people a template or a blueprint where you can go with that energy to make change there's some really good examples of people that are doing that their prayers um particularly um immortal technique who's set up an orphanage but you don't hear enough about that work. You hear more about the, the anti-establishment rhetoric and very appropriate because you know there's injustice. But how about we just take some of that responsibility and power to change our own spaces? Let's take that power back from being reactionary to being proactive, to being creative. And this is what we're doing here as well. We're taking that hip hop energy, that hip hop ethos, that hustle energy, but using it to change our immediate spaces. Let's be self-sufficient. Let's not rely on the man. Let's, let's be economically independent by having our water supply, by having our own energy, by having our own food. Once you've got those things, you're set. You can be creative in the way you wanna be. It's also allowed me the space has allowed me to just be like, a, to be my, my true essence. And it's just identifying yourself in nature, who you truly are. In society, in hip hop, I'm not recognized. I'm not given my props. I'm not given my, do you know what I mean? Because of the role I play. And within hip hop, because it still operates, it tries to define itself as uh, a, a distinct way of operating or a distinct social model but it doesn't really because it still defines itself on material success. The goals are, if you've got the biggest thing, then you're successful. If you've got the, the largest click, you're successful. But no one talks about the small person or the people that are actually on the peripheries that are contributing and supporting the hip hop scene. And that's very much what I do, do you know what I mean, throughout my career. So it's been really invaluable for me to recognize myself through nature and have a place within nature and the world because in hip hop it doesn't seem like I fit in, I don't seem to fit in, I don't seem to have a place. I do now because I found myself in nature and I'm just showing that everyone has a place, we call it biodiversity, everyone has a role to play. And so for me having a garden is really about, you know what, I don't have to go out to the hip hop world no more. I can create everything I need here. Do you know what I mean? So.